every time Christ is called the head of the church, this authority and leadership language is missing. It's actually a servant role, not a leadership one. So we really think this is important to be faithful to the biblical witness, but also in the way that this is lived out for women. Because realistically, if you think women should have leadership in the church but not the home, how is that woman who's not considered equal in her home ever going to have leadership in the church? Hello and welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. My name is Josh Fitzpatrick, and I'm one of the associate pastors here at First United Methodist Church Richardson. And here with me today, I have Eric Chikowski. Hello, hello. And Julie Richter. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. I'm excited for another interview today. That's right. For sure. Well, it is Holy Week. It is Holy Week. The week before Easter, leading up to Easter... We are in between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, and we've got coming up tomorrow evening, we have Maundy Thursday and Good Friday as well. So let's unpack those just a little bit. Yeah, sure. For those who don't know, this is one of the weeks in the traditional Christian calendar that we observe sort of in preparation for Easter. And so Palm Sunday is the observation or the celebration of Jesus's triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. And traditionally in the church have opportunities for children, at least in our church, children to wave palms again in sort of celebration and observance of that holy day. So then as the week continues, we hit Thursday, which is traditionally called Maundy Thursday. That word Maundy comes from a Latin root, mandatum, which means commandment, as Jesus gave this commandment to his disciples as he broke bread with them and celebrated the Passover feast. He gave him this new commandment to love each other as I have loved you. And so that's something that stands at the heart of that day. And then on Good Friday, we talk about the last seven words that Jesus spoke leading up to his death on the cross. And so that service, even though we call it good, is actually a very important and even heavy service where we talk about the death and suffering of Jesus. And especially in the Christian church, we believe that before we get to resurrection, we have to acknowledge the death and we have to acknowledge what the cross means in our lives. So it's a really important day and week for the Christian church. And then, of course, on Sunday morning, we've got Easter Sunday, where we actually celebrate resurrection, and we have a great opportunity to celebrate that. At this church in particular, we have a 7.30 Easter sunrise service, and then worship services at 8.30, 9.45, and 11 as well. So if you're looking for a place to worship, we'd love to have you there, and it'll be a great day of celebrating resurrection. So, Eric, one of the coolest things that I think about the Easter story is the fact that women were the first preachers, that women were the first ones to show up to Jesus's tomb. They were the first ones to be told that Jesus had risen from the dead, and they were given the commandment to go out and tell the world, and they did. Our guest today is someone who is very passionate about empowering women in ministry. She has a blog. She is a pastor of a church. She has a following who look to her for guidance and leadership on this topic. And so we're really excited this morning to get the opportunity to interview Kate Wallace Nunnally. Today's guest is Pastor Kate Wallace Nunley, who is the lead pastor of Wellspring Free Methodist Church in Bakersfield, California, and the co-founder of the Junia Project, which she will tell us all about today. It is a pleasure to have you on the podcast today, Kate. Thanks for having me. So I just want to begin by setting some context for our listeners. Would you tell us a little bit about what the Junia Project is and how you founded it? Sure. The Junior Project is a volunteer community of women and men who advocate for the inclusion of women in leadership at all levels of the Christian church. We have a website that teaches egalitarian theology in little nuggets at a time to try to make it more feasible for the average person in the pews to grasp it. And it's been a really interesting journey with the Junior Project. We started it about five years ago. My mom and I were both involved at Azusa Pacific University here in Southern California, and they have an event every year called Common Day of Learning. And we had been noticing that the students coming into APU had a more conservative view of gender roles than they had when I was a student there. And we were curious about this, but we thought we should do some sort of presentation on how APU is a Wesleyan holiness school 
and our view on that is a little bit different than other evangelicals. So we did a presentation on egalitarian theology and the biblical equality of men and women, and we packed out the room. There were people like standing in the hallway, and there was so much interest to learn more that we had a sign-up sheet in the front for people who wanted to learn more and they could host another event. And we had 50 people show up two weeks later at my parents' house, faculty, staff, and students and people from the community. And we did another event. And from there, we learned that people wanted an online resource about all of this. So we started a Facebook group. This was probably April of 2013. And then, you know, the students left for summer and We just kind of stayed in contact on the Facebook group, sharing random resources online. And by the end of the summer, that Facebook group grew from 50 people in Azusa, California, to over a thousand people in 50 countries. And it was a really interesting (laughs) view into how much people want to talk about this because it was pretty taboo back then, even just five years ago, to talk about women in leadership in the church. And we're sharing all these different online resources, but we're like, well, maybe, you know, we don't agree 100% with everything we're sharing. Maybe we should start a little blog to supplement the information we're sharing. So we started the Junior Project blog, and we were just really surprised at how many people started subscribing to it. So it kind of became its own thing. But that's kind of how it all got started. So obviously a topic of conversation that people are really interested in and so neat to hear sort of the organic trajectory of how initiatives like this get started or blogs like this get started. You mentioned sort of your surprise at all along the way, the amount of people that were interested in the conversation. When did you realize the blog was reaching a really large audience? You know, my, my mom is the genius behind the blog. She's the one who had looked up how to even do a self-hosted blog site on WordPress. She (laughs) became the expert on all of that. And she noticed it pretty quickly. I was still really skeptical. Like, who wants to hear what we have to say, mom? Like, why would we put in all the effort for this? So she's really the genius behind that. And I think she noticed it by Christmas of 2013, which I'm so glad she did that because now we have almost 4,000 blog subscribers. Wow. And we get a good amount of people coming to the website every day, even when we're not actively posting new material, which has been really encouraging. Wow, that's great. Well, and a website or blog is only as good as its content. And I found myself over the last couple of days on your blog and uh, subscribed to it. And (laughs) it was almost like going down a rabbit hole. I went from article to article of things that I wanted some information about and some things that I would find helpful and resources that I thought, gosh, I could share this with some of my male colleagues and female colleagues about how do we talk about women in ministry? What are things that we can do and say to advocate for one another? And what are some of even the biblical verses that are sometimes leaned on that we could talk about in terms of a biblical context and how we talk about women in ministry through those lenses? So I found that website and your blog and the Junior Project in incredibly helpful for myself. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. Some of our popular post topics for those listening, if they're curious, are probably our three top most read posts are all about 1 Timothy (laughs) 2.12. Yeah. All written by my mom, because again, she's the genius. (laughs) Her post, Diffusing the 1 Timothy 2.12 bomb, actually came out of that second meeting where we had 50 people show up who wanted to learn more. We had split them up into groups and They all presented their experience as women in the church, and one of them drew a picture of men and women kind of climbing up this mountain of faith, and then there was like a bomb dropping on them that was called 1 Timothy (laughs) 2.12, and it was just kind of how that's used as a weapon against women, or Mm. anyone really asking questions about a deeper meaning of what the Bible might be talking about, and people kind of throw out that verse against women as if it's a bomb, and it just kills all conversation and all learning. Yeah. So her post, Diffusing the First Timothy 2.12 Bomb, is our most read post by far. But other popular ones have to do with myths of male headship, how we've misunderstood what male headship means as we think it's leadership in our cultural context and how that's not actually what the biblical message means with that. We have a lot of people asking us for resources on domestic abuse. So that has ended up being a topic we weren't fully prepared for. 
Mm. but we've had to offer a lot of information about. One that's really popular is 10 ways male privilege shows up in church. So even if we say with our mouths that we agree with women in leadership, a lot of times everything still swings towards men. So talking about that kind of thing. But it's been really interesting to hear feedback and to talk with people who've found this in, as an encouragement and a helpful tool. So I'm glad that you found it like that too. Yeah, well, and in the midst of the feedback, I imagine that you've gotten some pushback as well. So without mentioning specific names, can you tell us maybe a little bit of pushback that you've had to fight through as you've advocated for women in ministry? Yeah, it's less now, but definitely in the beginning. I think because even in the last two years, the general feel in just everyday pop culture and everything else has shifted towards women. Women are starting to be believed when they say something's happened to them. It's a really big shift. And so and there's all these pushes to have more women in commercials and TV and voices and leadership. So it's not as taboo anymore. But when we started, we got a lot of emails and comments on our website. And the interesting thing about that, so they would be all sorts of things from threatening physical violence to just condemning us to hell. But the interesting thing about them submitting those through our website is they have to put their information so we know who they are. (laughs) So we would kind of look at them and the majority of the physical violence threats were given by male pastors, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. And so we would, you know, you follow their email back to a website and it's a church website. That was really disheartening. Mm. We were definitely hitting a nerve, I think, but there was some sort of threat felt, I think by these men, which was really disheartening. And then you deal with the normal Twitter trolls, or I was just looking back at some of the videos from different talks we've given around the country. And there was one talk in particular where one of the comments had said, this is Satan twisting scripture, making it seem appealing to women, but it was never meant for women. (laughs) Hmm. So, you know, you get a lot of different things, but you just got to, I think it was Rachel Held Evans who said, You have to remain soft on the inside and still have a hard shell, which is kind of a weird Mm. balance, but I found that to be helpful. So, Kate, the blog empowers women in ministry. I've heard some pastors say that, well, sure, I can get behind the idea that women can be pastors of the church, but I can't get behind the idea that women are equal partners in marriage. Sure. But the Junior Project also empowers women in marriage. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, and there's definitely a difference There are lots of people who, like you said, would be egalitarian in church practice, but not in marriage. Most of that, I think, comes down to our beliefs about headship and Ephesians 5, where husbands and wives are both spoken to by the Apostle Paul. And in our cultural context, we think that head means leader, like the head of a company. We think of like the CEO. But there's a lot of biblical scholarship that says that Head doesn't mean that in every language, like French would be a language as an example, that head doesn't have any connotation of leadership. Hmm. And they argue that Koinonia Greek, the language that the New Testament is written in, is also one of those languages where head didn't necessarily mean leadership. It actually most of the time meant a literal head. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you have this imagery that Paul is giving and then people trying to take a very literal meaning out of it. So I think it mostly comes down to your interpretation of what that means, because people assume that Ephesians 5 says that the husband is the leader of the wife, but that word is actually nowhere in there. It's all based on your interpretation of the word head. Oh, that's fascinating. Yes. Yeah, so the other phrase that's not in the Bible is man is the head of the household, mm-hmm. which I think is another all right. interesting thing that most people assume is in there. But it again comes down to your interpretation of what it means to be the head. And Ephesians 5 actually only says man is the head of the wife, not the head of the household, which again is a really strange phrase. And you have to look into what that even means. Mm -hmm. But our basic understanding of that in a very short summary is that husbands are only called the head of the wife in one way, as Christ is the head of the church. So to understand what it means for the husband to be the head of the wife, you have to do a study on what it means for Christ to be the head of the church. And Christ as the head of the church is mentioned five times in the New Testament in Colossians and Ephesians. And 
Christ is described as the head as giving abundant life, helping her flourish, saving her, loving her, giving himself up for her or dying for her. We don't see authority over leadership, decision-making, rulership. So every time Christ is called the head of the church, not the head of anything else, but of the church, this authority and leadership language is missing. It's actually a servant role, not a leadership one. So we really think this is important to be faithful to the biblical witness, but also in the way that this is lived out for women. Because realistically, if you think women should have leadership in the church, but not the home, how is that woman who's not considered equal in her home ever going to have leadership in the church? Mm. Because she's not considered equal. She has no say over her own life then, her husband does. And she's not realistically then going to assume any sort of leadership or servanthood in the church. So it's really, in my opinion, how it plays out is not really consistent. So if you really think women should be leading in the church, then you're going to have to take a good hard look at your beliefs in marriage if you really want to see that happen. Yeah. Kate, your perspective on this particular topic definitely points to your passion around empowering women in ministry specifically. And you've spoken a little bit even about the obstacles that you've had to face as you have begun this project and begun speaking in very public platforms around empowering women in ministry. Can you talk a little bit about where your passion started for empowering women? And then maybe a little bit about how you've chosen to overcome those obstacles when you hear some of the feedback that has been disturbing and really hurtful for you in ministry. Sure. My passion for the subject started when I was in eighth grade. I had transferred to a private Christian school from public school that year, and my female Bible teacher was the first person to tell me that women shouldn't teach the Bible, (laughs) which the irony is just too funny. But (laughs) That really struck a chord with me. I had grown up in a church plant that both of my parents helped to start, and we never really talked about this either way, but I always saw women doing everything except being the lead pastor. But we were a church plant, so we needed everyone. So it was never really a question of who could do what. It was who's available to do what because we need someone to do it. And I watched my mom serve as an elder and as a children's pastor and serve communion and lead worship. So I just had no idea there were Christians who thought that women shouldn't do these things. Hmm. And so I was sitting in Bible class and hearing this being taught. And I raised my hand and started asking questions. I was not trying to push back. I was honestly trying to figure out why this woman was teaching this. And I remember by the end of the class period, I had had her take back most of what she had taught, and she ended up (laughs) saying, well, women just can't be lead pastors. Mm -hmm. So she went from women can't speak in church to women just can't be lead pastors because of these questions that an eighth grader had. So I learned that year that this is just a part of who God made me to be. This is just a part of my identity. That day I went home and I asked my parents what we believe about women in leadership, and my parents are academics. So they gave me three stacks of books and didn't want to tell me what to think, wanted me to figure it out on my own. So I read patriarchal theology by people who are patriarchal. I read complementarian theology by people who are complementarian. And I read egalitarian theology by people who are egalitarian. And I went on a quest that lasted through college, really, through high school and college, to try to figure out what I believed. And in the meantime, I was in this junior high and then high school that was this conservative Christian school And I was hearing, you know, a very patriarchal view of women. And this just sparked this in me. That whole journey turned my faith into what my family believes, into what I believe. And more than anything, I wanted to know what God had for me as a woman, because this wasn't just an intellectual pursuit. This actually dictated everything about my life. Mm. Because if God didn't want me to do certain things, I didn't want to do them. And I wanted to please God with everything I did. So I went on this journey and felt that God really ministered through that to me. And I became really passionate when I came out the other side, believing that God created both men and women in the image of God. And both men and women are called to go out and make disciples of all nations. And the Holy Spirit empowers both men and women to lead and serve in the church. My passion mostly came out as I wanted to teach my fellow classmates that there was a view that was different 
than what my teachers were teaching. It didn't make me a darling of the Bible department. Mm. (laughs) I got sent out of the room multiple times into detention, but it was that passion that I didn't want people to be stuck thinking there was only one way. I thought at least to be fair, these Bible teachers should teach that there were multiple views and multiple options so people could decide for themselves and pray about it and see God in it. But I watch all these young women being told that they shouldn't be educated because they shouldn't have jobs outside the home. And I'm seeing their incredible intelligence and their wit and their humor. And I'm thinking they could do anything God calls them to, and they just need to be told that they have permission to do that. So Hmm. that was my original passion for it. As I grew up and went to secular grad school and became friends with people who had grown up Christian or Catholic and were no longer so, I was realizing that a lot of women, high capacity, capable women who are going to do amazing things in this world are already doing amazing things in this world. They're not allowed to do those things inside the church. And so they don't want anything to do with the church. And the church is missing out on all of their incredible gifts and talents. And these women aren't going to church because of this. And I know people say that this is not a big umbrella issue, that this is not a salvation issue. But when you're talking about women's roles in theology, you're telling half of humanity what they're allowed to do or not. So this is a salvation issue to half of us. Because it is something that we can decide whether we want to be a part of or not, right? And are we really saying that we believe in gender roles so strongly, that women shouldn't have leadership so strongly, that we're going to risk saying that all these women shouldn't be a part of the church? Or are we going to admit that maybe there's something we haven't looked at deep enough, or that these other biblical scholars who think that the Bible actually teaches equality of men and women that maybe that's something we should grasp as we are trying to reach this world because all of these women are changing the world, but they're not bringing any of those gifts into the church because they're not welcome Mm -hmm. to. But what would happen if we had some humility and sought God in this and thought, you know, maybe God did create women equal and maybe we dive into this and find that there's something deeper to this theology and then we can reach all of those women And imagine what the church could do then without half of its population stuck on the bench. So that's where a lot of my passion came later in life. All of my friends who are so offended by the church, and it is offensive. It's offensive when, you know, male pastors come up to me and tell me I shouldn't be preaching or I shouldn't be speaking or because I'm female, what I'm doing at my church every week isn't preaching, which I'm like, oh, that's that's a shame because I, I go through the same struggle as every preacher when you're trying to create a sermon. So. Yeah. <laughs> that distinction has always been interesting to yes. me. Yeah. Well, it's like, I wasn't aware we spoke with our genitals, um, <laughs> but, you know, but like those things really are offensive and I don't think they mean them to be. Some do, I guess, but the majority don't. We're all just seeking to find what God has for us, trying to seek what the scriptures say and be faithful to it. But I think we need a little bit more imagination and we need a little bit more humility. Because if you think you shouldn't be learning from women, (laughs) I don't know, that doesn't seem to have the same spirit of Jesus who humbled himself and became a servant and considered others as better than himself. I think we could really use some humility in this conversation. Well, it's so great to hear your passion around that topic. And I think that's an important distinction that you made that Hopefully, most people don't mean offense by it, but I loved your thought that they just need maybe a larger imagination or maybe really to just dig deeper into what the scripture says and how women in leadership affects salvation possibilities for women and affects their relationship with Christ in and of itself. And Kate, I wanted to mention the other thing that really struck me was what a gift from your parents to give you those three books and let you walk through that journey on your own. Let you discover, let you pray, let you read and learn and find conviction on your own through that process rather than telling you or sort of spoon feeding what they wanted you to believe or uh, what they thought the right thing was. What a gift that is. Yeah. And my mom had definite opinions about it. So I admire her 
strengthen that. <laughs> Absolutely. So inevitably, with as many people as the Junior Project is reaching, I'm sure that you've got stories about the impact that it's having in churches and for men and women all over. Would you mind sharing a story of a positive impact that you feel like your work has had for a church or for men and women in ministry? Sure. Almost every week we get messages from women about, you know, I had no idea anyone thought this. I had no idea anyone thought God created us to be equal or that God had anything more for me than what my dad or my husband had told me. We hear from all these women who have found so much freedom reading the stuff on our site and they have so many questions. You know, it seems like it's a blog and then you get these emails and you realize you're really pastoring to all these people. You're Mm. caring for their souls. You're caring for their hearts and they pour themselves out on these emails. Just so thankful to have found someone who validates what they always thought had to have been true. And there's all these women, right? So all around the world who find themselves in towns or cities where they feel like they're the only ones who think this. Their churches and their families and their friend groups are all patriarchal or complementarian. And they come online and they find this whole online community. So they kind of find this support, even though geographically they can't find that around them. They come online and they find this community of support and education and solidarity. And it's it's really interesting to see because a lot of women don't have the ability to just go to the other church. Mm-hmm. All the churches in town have the same view on women. And a lot of women are afraid to leave their home church or they're afraid to take their families away from the church because that's where their kids are in this great kids ministry. The rest of their family is super involved and getting fed and they're the only ones who aren't. So they just stay quiet about it and they they suffer alone. But then they can come online and find all of this stuff. They basically find church online. So that's been a really encouraging thing. But we've also been contacted by a handful of churches, either the elder board or the pastoral team, who are asking us how to navigate bringing this topic up and taking either, you know, the other leaders in the church. If it's the elder board, they want to know how to bring this up with the pastors. If it's the pastors, they want to know how to bring it up with the elders, (laughs) how to walk through this shift because they really feel like God's calling their church to shift, to accept women and leadership and equality in marriage. So it's been really interesting to talk with these. They're mostly men and to hear their stories and hear how God has been challenging their assumptions. And they just really want to bring this freedom to their church. Mm. And we talk it through with them. And it's usually a few years long process of exploring these topics with the elder board or the pastoral staff before they bring it to the congregation. But it's been really neat to see. We've had two that have come out the other side and it seems to have been going really well and some that are still in process, but that is incredibly encouraging. And what a humbling thing for us. So, you know, we're a blog Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we have these churches reaching out to us for help, which is, it's just amazing what God will do. Mm. It's been really encouraging to see this. The most encouraging has been, you know, we called it the Junior Project and not like the Wallace blog or Gail and Kate online, because most blogs at that time were usually just the person's name. We didn't want it to be our names because we wanted it to be a platform for other voices. And not many people were blogging on women in the church at the time. It was mostly Sarah Bessie and Rachel Held Evans. Christians for Biblical Equality was putting out really great work, but they didn't have a blog. So we saw all these voices online for little tiny snippets of comments. And we're like, hey, we want you to write for us. Why don't you turn that comment into a blog post and write? Or we'd find these little tiny blogs that don't have a big readership. And we'd be like, hey, why don't you write for us? And it's been really neat to see this become a platform for other writers. And they've all, you know, then gone on to write for CBE and for different blogs or publications, and then they have their own blogs now. And so we were just at this time where we got to see the Holy Spirit use not just us, but everything online to increase the number of people talking about women in the church. And it went from being so few people and such a hard conversation to being 
a common conversation over the last five years. Right. And that has been the most encouraging because we can put out a post that's all about, you know, the five myths of male headship and people actually have a conversation about it. They're not afraid to share it on their Facebook page. They're not afraid to retweet it. They're not afraid to reach out to us because something is shifting. I think the Holy Spirit is really, you know, part of that pouring out on sons and daughters. We've seen a huge shift and it's been fun to be a small part of that. Yeah. Kate, what I love about the work that you've been part of is that you've used it to not only talk on the blog about empowering women, but as you've said, use it as a platform to actually empower women and some of these other voices that don't get heard as often. And I heard a quote the other day that talked about once you turn the light on, you can't unsee something. And so Mm -hmm. what I feel like a lot of this work is doing is shedding light. It's turning on the light. So those things that were going unspoken, those things that were going unheard, actually have a place and a voice that we're going to not choose to just simply not see anymore but actually begin conversations about and change some things in the midst of. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Now, Kate, full disclosure for our listeners, you are the lead pastor of Wellspring Free Methodist Church, which is the church that I happen to have previously been the lead pastor (laughs) of because we had the privilege of planting that church together. And over the course of the past couple of years before our move back to Texas here, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you started the blog— you hadn't yet started feeling this call into ministry. Is that right? That's right. It just seems fascinating to me that you're empowering women in ministry. You haven't quite answered or even felt this call. And now on this side of it, you've answered the call and you've even stepped into a lead pastor position. Tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, I I definitely felt a call to advocate for women, to educate people, to get the conversation going That's what I thought my mom and I were doing. I didn't know. My mom had never voiced to me that she had felt a call to pastoral ministry when she was young, Hmm. but was totally discouraged from it. So I didn't know that until probably last year. But for me, I just really wanted to empower women who felt the call. Why would you want to keep the Holy Spirit in a box? You know, (laughs) you have this needy world and you know, we have all these leaders who would say to my generation when I was growing up that you can do anything and we're praying for people of your generation to step up and do things for the kingdom. And then you grow up and you become a woman and then they take all that back. Like, oh, we didn't mean that for you. Mm. The injustice of that and the ignorance of that just got me. And I wanted women to not be put in a box by their churches that when they were kids, you know, encouraged them to do anything. I wanted the church to be less awkward around these girls who grow into women. I wanted to help the church flourish. I wanted to encourage these women who have these amazing experiences being called by God to share God's message, to bring life and faith to this group of people who they have been put in that context. And I I really felt like I was only called to advocacy. Nothing in me wanted to be a pastor. It was never <laughs> part of the plan. Mm-hmm. In fact, I always thought being a pastor would be the hardest job ever. It didn't sound fun at all. <laughs> and it just wasn't a part of the plan. In fact, when, when my husband Leaf and I moved to Bakersfield and our denomination asked us to think about planting a church, our response was, no, we're not pastors. So then they called us back when you, Josh, were going to move to Bakersfield. And they're like, okay, we got you a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay, I guess I could be part of a church planting team as long as I'm not a pastor. Because it just, I don't know, it just didn't seem appealing to me at all. I remember listening to some women preach and say, you know, we need to stop talking about it and just everyone get out and do it. And I remember thinking, no, that's fine, but I'm not called to do it. I'm called to advocate for those who do. So I always picture the Junior Project as the cheerleaders of the women who are actually doing the hard work. But they were the real heroes. They should have had the spotlight. And so we're trying to shine it on them. And then my plans got all messed up. So <laughs> as God tends to do, right. my plan was to teach political science at a college level. And so I was applying for PhD programs at the same time that you, Josh, and my husband, Leif, and I were all planning this church plant. And it just felt like it wasn't the right step that I needed to go to seminary. And I didn't want to pastor with it, but I thought maybe it would help my work with the junior project or my speaking with the junior project. 
and it doesn't really have to fit in the plan. I could do it and then go get my PhD. So I started seminary and in my first year of seminary, you know, was going along with this planting the church. And in my first class in seminary, we were studying all the women in Genesis who are barren and God comes and turns them into mothers of God's people. And my husband and I were also starting to try to start a family and we were being told that we might not be able to. And that was a really powerful time for me to be reading in scripture that God sees barren women, whereas I was learning that I was barren or I might be barren, but that God doesn't just see them. He chooses them. God chooses them to mother God's people. And that started working something in me. And at the same time, you know, we're ministering as a team to these people at our church plant and I'm watching Josh pastor to them and something in me just starts to yearn for that, that I wanted to mother God's people, even if that looked different than mothering, you know, a child. And I started seeing these connections between pastoral ministry and what a mother does, feeding their kids and caring for their kids and protecting their kids and raising them up. And that seemed a lot like what a pastor did. Hmm. And I was sitting in a class (laughs) where they were talking about the job of a pastor. And they were saying those things. And the woman next to me nudges me. And she's like, man, that sounds a lot like being a mom. And I was like, (laughs) yeah, it does. And something kind of just clicked. The moment I remember feeling a call to pastoral ministry, I looked down at my phone during class and someone from our church plant had texted me and said like, Hey Rev. And like, I have this question for you. She's just teasing me, calling me that, but she really did see me as a pastor. And in that moment, I, I said like, God, I want I want to be a pastor. I want to do this. Mm. And and Josh had asked me and my husband Leaf to both consider being volunteer associate pastors at the church plant. So we started that way and just kind of grew from there. It was nice to kind of have an ease into it, but it's still honestly been an adjustment. It's been about a year since I took that associate role and then became the lead pastor later. But The identity piece is still, I'm still working it out (laughs) because Mm. it was just never a part of what I wanted. And you've been killing it ever since. (laughs) (laughs) For the sake of our listeners, there's three terms that you keep using that I think would be helpful just to set the context for our conversation. Patriarchal, complementarian, and egalitarian. Would you define those for us? Sure. So patriarchy is this idea that men can and should lead and run everything and women should be subordinate in everything to men. It's a worldview and a value system. It also has a theology that goes along with it, that God created men to be in charge and lead, and God created women to follow that leadership in everything, because God created men more capable, more spiritual, more intelligent. Egalitarianism is the idea that God created men and women to be equal, and They both bear God's image. Egalitarians tend to not believe in gendered roles as prescriptive, but to think that God can call men to be stay-at-home dads and women to work, and women can hold any leadership position in the church, partnering with their brothers. And then around the 1980s came this development of complementarianism, which aimed to soften patriarchy. They admitted that men and women were created equal by God, but that they were intended to fill different purposes. And those purposes meant that men were always in leadership and women were always in subordinate to that leadership. So that's kind of those terms. I always like to ask, you know, can people actually be equal if the different roles they were quote unquote meant to fill means that one is always in leadership and one is always subordinate? I would argue that that's that's a philosophical fallacy, but (laughs) yes. Yeah, no, that's great. That's very helpful. Kate, you mentioned earlier that y'all chose not to use either one of your names, you or your mom's name, when you started the Junia blog. So where does the name come from? Yeah. So Junia is an apostle, a female apostle listed in Romans chapter 16, verse 7. And the apostle Paul writes to Andronicus and Junia, his kinsmen and fellow servants, They're well-known among the apostles. And for a long time in history, translators added an S to Junia's name. So it read Junius to try to make it seem like it was a male Greek name because they 
couldn't imagine that there was a female who was an apostle. Mm. So for a lot of church history, her identity was changed to being a man. And then, you know, later translators were realizing that Junius is not a Greek name now, nor has it been ever. But Junia is even still a prominent Greek name for women. And so they changed it back to Junia, claiming her to be female once again, a female apostle. And when that happened, some other translators were like, okay, well, if she's female, then maybe maybe he wasn't saying she was an apostle. So now some translations say that she was female, Junia, but say that the apostles knew them well, not that they were well known among the apostles. Wow. So we just thought her journey is very representative of what women in the church go through. If you mm-hmm. have leadership skills, well, then you better not be a woman because then you can't use them. You know, if you're a, a woman, then you have certain roles you need to fill, but you have all these women who are leaders in the church who need to use that leadership. So we just thought it was perfect name. And by claiming Junia Project, we get to claim that she was female and an apostle. So that was an extra bonus. <laughs> wow, what a beautiful great. image for the work that y'all do. And I'm struck by both of our denominational families, United Methodists and Free Methodists alike, have long histories of empowering women in ministry, their egalitarian systems as you've defined for us. But for those of us who live and worship and work in those systems, I wonder if sometimes that leaves us to take it for granted. So are there things that we can do to contribute to the empowerment conversation on a larger scale? Yeah, totally. I think education is really important. So being sure that you are providing materials and sermons and Sunday school classes that educate people why we do what we do in our traditions, even if it's not only diving into these scriptures that are controversial about women, even if it's just saying, look, here's our history and here's how women formed our church and here's what women have always done in our church. And then you know, diving into here's all the women who served in the New Testament, in the new church, and give them the education that is the background for the beliefs. I think where we come into some problems is when we take it for granted, and then our people are faced up against other Christians who are like, well, why? Why would you do that? Doesn't the Bible clearly say women shouldn't lead? And then our people aren't literate in it. They don't know why. Mm. They just say, well, my church teaches this. And we never want people to believe something simply because the church teaches it, right? We want them to have ownership of it and to understand and to experience God for themselves through that. So I think that's a really important piece. The other piece is if we're just saying we believe it and not actually putting women in the pulpit and not putting women as lead pastors and elders, then we don't actually fully think that we actually believe it, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like you you walk into a church and a man greets you and ushers you to your seat and a man welcomes you and a man reads scripture that's translated mostly by men and talks about God as a man. And then you're led in worship by a team of men. And then a man gets up and preaches to you. And then a man gets up and asks you for money. And then a man serves you communion. And then you go outside and you eat treats and drink coffee made by women Mm -hmm. saying in that service you believe in women leadership doesn't actually show people what that is. And I think the education piece is huge, but another huge part is letting people experience God through the mouth of a woman, Mm -hmm. letting people experience God through the embodiment of a woman in front of them. That changes you too, because then you see God, you experience God through that ministry, and that's also transformative. Kate, it's so good to hear you say that. I've shared with a number of people that some of the most transformational experiences and some of the most effective pastors, lead pastors specifically that I've worked with in ministry have been women. Mm -hmm. And so I think to be encouraged to experience the truth of God, experience the gospel from the mouth of a woman, I think can be really impactful for people as it has been for me. Yeah. And there are these lists going around of powerful female preachers and powerful female speakers You know, and if anyone is hoping to do that, I would say contact us. We have lots of material on the education piece. You don't need to start from scratch or remake the wheel. We can provide you with that kind of educational information and we can give you some names of people. But I really would encourage you to find the women in your church already who also are feeling that call and that drive to preach and minister to them, mentor them, train them, give them opportunities. And then you won't have to go outside of your church to find them either. Mm. 
That's super helpful. Thanks, Kate. So there's one question that we ask every guest on the podcast, and that is this. Up to this point in your life, what's one thing you wish someone would have told you? Hmm. What a great question. Um, I wish someone would have told me when I was young that God honors honest doubt. Hmm. That it's okay to have questions and to seek and to doubt because God is big enough and can handle honest doubt from someone who wants to find the truth and wants to seek God in it. That is awesome. Thank you, Kate. Again, the blog is thejuniaproject.com. And it has been so good to hear from your heart, to hear from your passions. We just pray God's blessing over you. Thank you for joining us here today, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thank you all. This was fun. One of the things that I love that Kate said is this idea that we have high capacity, highly intellectual, highly skilled women contributing what they have to the secular workforce, and yet the one place that they aren't contributing and they can't is the church. And that just seems ironic to me, especially in light of Easter, especially in light of what we mentioned previously at the beginning of the episode, that the first preachers were women. And I don't think that's changed. I deeply believe, as Kate does and as all of us around here do, that women should still be allowed to preach today. So one of those women that we find in the Easter story is Mary Magdalene when she encounters an empty tomb and then encounters Jesus. We want to leave you today with a poem by Jan Richardson called The Magdalene's Blessing as an invitation or an open door to the can'ts and don'ts in our lives where Jesus says yes. You hardly imagined standing here. Everything you ever loved suddenly returned to you looking you in the eye and calling your name. And now you do not know how to abide this ache in the center of your chest, where a door slams shut and swings open at the same time, turning on the hinge of your aching and hopeful heart. I tell you, this is not a banishment from the garden. This is an invitation, a choice, a threshold, a gate. This is your life calling to you from a place you could never have dreamed. But now that you have glimpsed its edge, you cannot imagine choosing any other way. So let the tears come as anointing, as consecration, and then let them go. Let this blessing gather itself around you. Let it give to you what you will need for this journey. You will not remember the words, they do not matter. All you need to remember is how it sounded when you stood in the place of death and heard the living call your name. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of More Than Sunday. If you like the podcast, please feel free to share it, go online and leave a comment, or give us a rating so that others might hear about us. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so make sure you also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss our next episode. If you want to find out more about First United Methodist Church Richardson, you can find us online at fumcr.com as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks to Kate Wallace Nunnally for joining us this week, and make sure you tune in next Wednesday when we have a conversation with Phil Martin. Have a great week, and happy Easter. Happy Easter.